Hello, everyone. It's Judith Botel, the host of Aligned and Thriving, here again to explore with another fabulous guest about how we may or may not be able to achieve work-life balance in our busy lives. I'm coming to you from Camaragle land in New South Wales, and I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and the elders past and present. So today with me, I have Kerry Comerford. Hi, Kerry. Hi, Jada. Thank you for having me. So lovely to have you here and to see you as well in your new environment, which we'll talk about a little bit later. It's probably not so new now. Anyway, let's get on with finding out about all about Kerry. So Kerry Comerford is an accomplished non-executive director on public and private boards and in the not-for-profit sector. She's a former CEO in the global arts and entertainment industry with extensive strategic and operational experience across Asia. A highly skilled senior executive with over 30 years proven leadership, working in culturally diverse and politically sensitive localities. As a highly regarded leader and chair, she has been a successful initiator and driver of organisational change across commercial and subsidised sectors in tourism and the arts. She has been a specialist advisor, a mentor, a consultant and collaborator with a proven ability for delivering strategic plans in often complex and challenging environments. She says that she is outcome-driven, yet able to assess complex stakeholder issues and work cooperatively to develop shared goals and viable objectives. She's having led both subsidised and commercial organisations, she's familiar with the complex and often conflicting driving forces behind both business models. Her experience as a non-executive director and executive director provides her with a sound knowledge of the vital role boards play in strategic planning and a strong commitment to good corporate governance and ethics. The only thing Kerry has left out there is that she's just a lovely person and somebody who is just a joy to work with. So I'm going to just editorialise and add that to there as well. So, Kerry, welcome again. And what have you done lately for your work-life balance? My big change is going back to something I used to do all the time, which was I used to start every day with a cup of tea and start writing in my journal. And over the last few years, I've just got out of the habit of doing that. And I've got up every morning and I reach for my iPad (laughs) while I have my cup of tea. None of us Um, do that. (laughs) So I've just started that process in the last few days and it's sometimes a challenge because I think, oh, I just need to look that up. But I'm hoping that I will get back into that rhythm. Fantastic. I love that. And I'm more than happy to be a bit of an accountability buddy for you on that. (laughs) I think it's so lovely when you start your day with that immediately jumping onto the social media. Uh, and checking your emails. Um, I'm not going to say I do that, but I think it's really nice when you do that. I think the only time I do that is when the phone's run down overnight and I have to recharge it. And then I go, oh, okay. Oh, it's quiet. So thanks for sharing that. And I think it's a great habit, especially with the journal and cup of tea. Let's go back a bit. Yuri, what did you learn as a child growing up about work? What were the early influences? The biggest influence was my mother. (laughs) I grew up in a fairly complex family environment where my mother went back to work when I was six weeks old. And she virtually, she very much held the family together. So she was working a lot. My father came in and out up until I was about five years old and then he disappeared for 11 years. Oh, okay. (laughs) And then he came home and my mother remarried him. But during that time, that's a whole other story. That's a whole other story. That's a whole mini series, Carrie. Yeah. So during that time, my mother worked my entire life. So she worked as a comptometrist. I don't know if your listeners will even know what that is. That's someone who works in a finance area. It was a mechanical calculator. And she worked in a range of jobs. It worked whatever the weekly, Monday to Friday, doing those jobs. And also during end of financial year, she used to work at home. Mm. So I grew up very much aware that work was a very important part of life. Mm. It was 
for her, it was very much about security and keeping her family together. Mm. But then interestingly, when she turned 40 and she had educated all her children, she said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to become a nurse. And she went off to train as a nurse. Oh, yeah. So, so it was interesting in that I suppose she introduced the idea of doing something that you want to do, but when you have the security to do it. Work hard. Make sure you've got all the security there. Take care of other people because she made sure you guys all had your education and then do something that she that wanted, she wanted to, do. to do. Yeah. yeah. Does she do nursing and, and work as a nurse as well? She did. It did get complicated, however, because then my father came home. Oh, okay, okay. And we're back and, to the mini series. <laughs> so we're back to the mini series. And so their life went in a different direction. Uh, okay. She did nerf for a few years, and then they got to the age where they travelled around and did a whole okay. lane. Okay, that, okay. That is even too. <laughs> so you've heard the pitch. If anyone wants to pick that one up, producer. Yeah, the film director and producer, writer, who I would have on this kid. So I'll let her know. But isn't it interesting? Many people on this program in the interviews I've done and some of them that I've recorded and it will be coming up soon, how often it's, especially for women, it's seeing their mother working that has the biggest influence on them. Yeah, I think it was very clear to me from a young age that I would work. Yes. I didn't have any thoughts that I would not work, but I didn't feel like I would have a career. My big ambition, so when I finished high school in fourth year, and this was the year my mother was going nursing, and I totally agreed with this, I went to business college and I loathed it. And I cried every day for six weeks until my mother could stand it no more and sent me back to school. Um, But my thought at that point had been that I would go to business college and I'd become a receptionist because it was the 70s and there was a big push on TV all the time. They ran these ads for the receptionist centre and it looked like the glamorous job. (laughs) sitting at the switchboard, just taking calls and sipping coffee. Yeah. So that was where I thought I was going to go. But I ended up going back to school and then I went to university and I got interested in drama. Right. Okay. Different direction. Yes, very different directions. Back to school, into university. And can I say that that wasn't such an assumed path for us people and coming through in the 70s and the 80s, maybe a little bit more when the free education came through, free tertiary education here in Australia. But I know my mother, she would have loved to have gone to university, but that just wasn't in the schema for her at the time. It wasn't free, a whole lot of reasons why she didn't go, but it was like she would have loved to have done university. And so she became this big advocate for the daughters to go to university. Really? Yeah. I was actually the only member, again, with the complexities of my family. Yeah. But I was able to go to university under the free education scheme. Yeah. But I didn't stay. I dropped out. Oh, okay. Uh, but it was a fantastic opportunity. Yeah. And I did drop out. So my story goes that I dropped out of university in the morning and in the afternoon I walked into the theatre world in Sydney and I got a job as a receptionist. And, and, and so it all connects. So got involved in drama and theatre and never really left. No, yeah. No, I still haven't really. <laughs> um, like the thing I have, but I haven't, yeah. So that was how I got into theatre. And interestingly enough, I think what really held me in good stead was that even despite my tears, at business college, I'd learnt to type. And so I was able to take on more tasks within the Theatre Royal. And I also worked as an usher. So picking up on some of my mother's approaches to work, I had two jobs. I worked as an usher at night and I worked as a receptionist during the day. Yeah. So that's where our life became work. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So you had a pretty strong work ethic. And as you said, your life became work because it seemed to be all consuming. Mm-hmm. But theatre, glamour job everyone would die for. Is that what it was like? It was quite interesting because I thought that theatre was all about being an actor. So I'd been doing amateur theatre 
and then got the job as a receptionist. And then I discovered once I was actually working in a professional theatre environment that there were all these other jobs and these other roles that helped support the performers in creating the theatre. And so I just followed that path. And the path was pretty fast, really, when I look back on it. Mm. I worked at the Royal for two years. Then I worked at Active Equity. Then I came to South Australia and I worked with a state theatre company and I changed jobs every two years. Mm. You know, I for a period of time just going into more senior administrative roles. Yeah. And I went to Perth for a couple of years and then I came back to Adelaide and then eventually I was working with the Adelaide Festival Centre in their commercial division and that's when then the former general manager of the Festival Centre had gone to work with Andrew Lloyd Webber's company and I then joined him and worked there for 24, 20, wow. 24 years. Wow. Okay. So what supported you through all of this? What were your internal beliefs and motivations, what would otherwise we call our values? But what were those sort of things that supported you through this rapid advancement in a very complex and changing environment where things probably happened quite quickly? I think there was a general commitment to work, just doing whatever it took. Some of my early mentors were great supporters of the artists. So that was a really important value. Yes. That when you were working in this industry, you were there to help support the creation of the work. And so that became a big role. And often I moved on so that I had better opportunities to work more closely with artists. There was just a passion and a commitment to what I was doing, I think. Yeah. And a desire to learn something new constantly. So right. I can do that now. What else could I do? I think it took me quite a while to start to think, oh, I could be the boss. Right. <laughs> oh. Sorry. Yeah. I think that I thought for a long time that I was a good support person and I was good and I was reliable and all those things were important to me, that I was a reliable worker. Yeah. Mm. So lots of great values there, the work ethic, the commitment, the passion, the love of the arts and the love of learning that was all supporting you in these, quite anyone who's worked in theatre knows it's a pressure cooker environment and everything is very serious when it's, except when it's not. But you know, <laughs> people take this stuff very seriously and yeah. it's not just about making a product, it's about somebody's vision. It's normally quite personal and the artists have quite a bit at stake and they do need to trust the team around them to hold that vision. And, yeah. and ensure that it is what they want the world to see in, in that collaboration. So that's all terrific. But when did you have that thought then that maybe you could be the boss? I think I like, started to work through various organisations and I took on a few 2IC roles. Yeah. So I was stepping in occasionally. And then I was able to go and work for some small arts organisations. I went to Perk and worked with a puppet company called Spare Parts Puppet Theatre and then with Deck Chair Theatre. And those were the roles where I became the general manager, still working very closely with artistic directors, but becoming that central person. And then from there I came back to South Australia and I went into kind of a tourism cultural job for a period of about 12 months and then I was appointed director of Tandanya the National Aboriginal Arts Centre here in Adelaide, which sadly no longer exists. Mm. But anyway, I was there and from there I went into commercial area. Yeah, which a lot of arts administrators, arts managers, arts leaders, CVs can look like that. (laughs) It's never a a vertical progression, very rarely. And then in those 24 years at the Really Useful Company, I went from executive director to general manager. It was just a long progression. Yes. In Australia and the arts, there are some companies that do have the, some sort of a corporate ladder you can climb, but it's normally a job, <laughs> yeah. not several options. And also yes. normally, I've coached so many people in the arts, it's normally a sideways step is needed before you can go up again. So that's often yeah. the way people do things. Or you just go and do something different mm-hmm. and develop new skills that way. Yeah. The opportunity for me to become CEO happened because the then CEO stepped aside. 
Yeah. So I say to people, it was not assumed that I would have that job. Right. Uh, and I had to go to London and say, no, I want you to consider me for this job. Wow. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And so how's your work-life balance through all of this? Oh, good days and bad days. <laughs> <laughs> On a personal level, my partner is an artist who worked in theatre that makes for interesting work-life balance because yeah. it's not your show, it's their show yeah. that you're juggling. I think particularly with the really useful company, I was travelling an enormous amount. So in a funny sort of way, the travelling probably helped me to start to focus a bit on the need for work-life balance. Mm -hmm. Every now and again, there'd come a point where I'd go, ah, this is impossible. I've got to start exercising. I must get back to yoga. I should be doing more journaling. All those things. And some of those goals, those lessons you learn, you may not do them all the time, but you do come back to them. And yeah. you do know when you need to come back to them, I think. I think that's what the secret is. One of the things that took me years, years of travelling before I would do things like go to an art gallery when I was in a new city. Yeah. And then I learned that really I could do that for an hour and a half. The world was not going to collapse. Yeah. And the, the, things like that made a huge difference. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. So it's like sort of inner knowing that when you need to recalibrate a little bit, but yes. it's also, I love that you're not like, there's an of rigidity about it or a perfectionism about it. It's that learning that when you need to perhaps focus a bit more inwardly or into moving your body, but it doesn't need to be a perfectionist approach to these things. Yeah. I have to say the biggest change in the last four years has been sleep. <laughs> but we'll get to that. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So I got to know Kerry. She'd had some of these very big, high profile jobs. And at that time, I was running Milk Crate Theatre. And Kerry was doing, you're just about to start work with Accessible Arts. I think I was just in that process of leaving the really useful company. Yeah, maybe you were. Yeah. And, and, we, yeah. Yeah. and you were also coming onto the board of Circle. Probably yeah. about that time. Yeah. yeah. So we just got to know each other as women who work in the arts. And then... So I left the really useful company, thought I'd go back to the arts because that's where I'd start. And I did a contract position with Oz Dance for about a year, with Oz Dance National. And then I took on this CEO of Accessible Arts. Yeah. And, uh, and I think we worked together at Accessible yes. Arts, which yeah. is great. Yes. I really good project. Yeah. Yeah. By so, uh, Carrie's Accessible Arts with Milk Crate Theatre. Milk Crate Theatre works with artists with disabilities, so there's an obvious connection there. I think we did some projects together and supported each other. And then I pitched a program to Kerry to uh, do a leadership program with women with disability in the arts. And if you want to go back and listen to the episode with Casey Gray, you will hear from a graduate of that program. And, yeah, but then something very interesting happened. In about just after we graduated, the first lot of Front and Center graduates, there was a certain worldwide incident, shall we say. Very weird. And I think Gary was still at Accessible Arts, so we're still in contact. And I remember you saying to me, and I remember this very clearly, you saying, yeah, kind of sucks, but I am so enjoying being able to have dinner with my, with my husband. And I was like, okay. That as such a, it was a wonderful positive outcome, but it was like, oh, this hasn't been a normal part of your life, obviously, up until now. Because you've, as you said, you're balancing two shows, you're traveling, he's probably traveling, et cetera, et cetera. Is that how it was for you guys? So the big challenge was when I joined the really useful company. Mark is an artist and he can work anywhere. And he makes ceramics and paints, so he needs a studio space. We would often live outside the city. And when we moved to New South Wales, we lived at Lake Macquarie. So I commuted to Sydney for five years, and then I went mad, which is what I say. I did. I was travelling five hours a day, as well as travelling overseas. We were able to buy a little cottage in Redfern. And so I lived down in Redfern during the week and I was only home at weekends when I was in the country. Yeah. And so we did that for 24 years. And then even after I left with a useful, 
with the jobs I took on, I found myself back in Sydney all the yeah. time. Yeah. And so COVID really was the first time we had spent lots and lots of time together. And I just, halfway through that process, I said, I don't want to go back to working in an office. <laughs> wow. Wow. And so we did a crazy thing. We put our house on the market. And we didn't tell anyone. We put our house on the market thinking, oh, this could take forever. Yeah. But it didn't. We sold our property in Lake Macquarie. And there was a plan at one point that we might go into Sydney and squat. We didn't think it would be somewhere we'd want to stay for a while. But then COVID kept continuing. And Mark had a project. He was designing Carmen the Opera for Cockatoo Island, which only happened in 2022, so it took a long time. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we were planning to go down to Sydney, do that, see where we were going and work out from there, but all that went to pieces. And so we kept looking at properties, thinking, what will we do next? Let's have an adventure. And we bought 86 acres in the Clare Valley online. There you go. So what do you think was the... Underlying motivation for that one. Let's take a quick break. Don't miss a single episode, so subscribe to Aligned and Thriving now to unlock a world of inspiration and practical strategies. And if you have subscribed, why not check out our IG account or join our community to navigate your own way to a happier and healthier working life. We played around. We joked occasionally about buying a property somewhere. Oh, I should add, the 86 Acres has a and b four B&B cottages on the property. Right. Um, so we joked about doing something like that over the years. Four cottages was not what I had in mind. <laughs> I was thinking one. Somewhere. Yeah. And we had met in South Australia. So there was a sense of at least we know people in Adelaide. Yeah. Neither of us had ever been to Clare. However, we packed up our house. We cleared out our house in the city. We avoided lockdowns or we got approval to cross the border at 9.15 the night before we were crossing the border <laughs> and we got into South Australia. We drove into this beautiful property in Watervale in the Clare Valley and here we are four years later. Wow. So in some ways, you've done the dream. You've done the move to the country dream and run the B&B and be in the vineyard area and Mark can continue to do his artwork. Yeah. Is that what it's like? <laughs> Most of the time. Oh, wow. Well, okay. It can happen. <laughs> it can happen. You know. So, I you know, there were a couple of really good things. That the business was already up and so it had been running as a business. The original owners of this property had built the house and the cottages, so that was there. I told them I didn't want to do anything for the first few months, so we closed down the business. And then I did some rebranding and we did some refurbishing and a few things like that. And then I said, we'll just take this really slowly. Yeah. But it was COVID and the Adelaide people were desperate to travel Oh. And we didn't really get to take it slowly. It right. took off there fairly quickly. Right. So I learned a lot very quickly. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I know some people who Airbnb, huge success. Other people couldn't wait to get out of it quick enough. Yeah. So I'm glad it's working out for you. Yeah. yeah. Is it, has it supported a better work-life balance for you? Yeah, in some ways. Sometimes no, sometimes finding that balance. We're very much doing it as an old-style B&B. So people can't just walk up and walk in and go in without me knowing them and seeing them and greeting them. Yeah. My husband bakes bread, so we greet them with fresh bread. And I've tried very much to pick up on all those years of travel, all the things that used to drive me crazy in hotel rooms, Ooh. and I've tried to address all those. Oh, so yeah. You, you get lots of tea bags, not two. <laughs> you get <laughs> A full litre of milk, oh. not those awful little <laughs> log life things. And I love that the people often leave me notes saying, oh my, my God, you've thought of everything. <laughs> oh, coat hangers? Coat hangers, real coat hangers. 
Yeah, real coat hangers, not those ones that are imprisoned in the cupboard. No, yeah, yeah. that's my boat there. And not having enough also. What else is one of mine? Oh, the tea bags and the milk. Yes. Oh, the tea bags and the milk drive me crazy. I will, wherever I go, I will walk straight to the general <laughs> convenience yeah, well, store and buy milk. And I leave home with a plastic bag full of tea bags. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. yeah, that's something else. Oh, oh, my husband there doesn't like doonas, so it's always trying to get a proper sheet on a bed, not just a doona oh, cover. No. I, I iron the sheet. Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> Such a great <laughs> Travel is great, but there are sometimes moments. Yeah, we've all got some horror story. Well. Oh, it's so great. So, Kerry, were there any other challenges that you found in making this transition? I think the challenge of dealing with a change in identity, having been a, a CEO of a big organisation and then moving to a small regional area, and taking on another role and being aware that in a regional community, tourism, some people are very supportive of tourism and other people aren't so supportive of the tourism. They feel like that that's taking away from what's important in the region. I also think I went through a bit of a period where I thought I should just leave the arts alone. It was time mm-hmm. for me to just move on. And I've had to accept the fact that I do still love the arts. And I yeah, blood. <laughs> well, well, maybe yeah. I'm not going to be at a show every week anymore, yeah. but I now feel more comfortable in returning and going back and seeing them where I did go for a period of time where I'm not going to go. <laughs> I'm being part of... I, Stepped away from a couple of boards when I moved here, but I have stayed connected to Circa because yeah. it's such an extraordinary company. And that's really good because it also keeps me mentally dealing with strategic planning, and particularly during COVID, adapting and changing direction rapidly. Yeah, it is a whole other conversation about Circa. Yeah, Maybe we'll yeah. have it one day. It's an amazing arts company. Uh, a lot of its business model is based around touring as well as performing locally. How would you describe Circa? We'll put a link to it. Yeah. It's one of Australia's great arts exports. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, an exceptional international touring company doing extraordinary work. Now with its First Nations company based in Cairns, now doing Circability, working with people with disability. Yeah. An, an, an extraordinary company doing extraordinary work. Yeah. Oh, it truly is. It's something that we should all be very proud of, uh, particularly the people who've actually had contact with it and have worked so hard to make it what it is. It had very humble beginnings and now it's, as Gary says, it is one of our great international cultural exports. And it's our 20th birthday. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, it isn't that long when you think about the no. impact the company has had. Yeah. 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 So we will have a link to Soka if you want to check it out because it is extraordinary. So I think you'll see the two sides of Kerry's life presented in Batanga Cottages and in Circa. And it shows how passion, commitment, hard work it can lead you to some very extraordinary places. So what's next for you? I'm still working on board, so I'm still on the Circa board. I was up in... Brisbane last week, seeing a professional new production by Circa. And I'm trying to work closely with the tourism community here in Clare to build that destination marketing activity here because I was on the tourism board in New South Wales before I left and I found that really interesting. It held me in good stead, I think, moving into this area and this business. Waterbell's a tiny little town. It's got a fabulous... Uh, award-winning restaurant and pub and lots of vineyards. And we're on the Riesling Trail, which is a major cycling trail around oh, to Clare Valley. And, in fact, we've joined what's known as the Clare Valley Wine and Wilderness Trail, which is a hiking trail, and people can actually hike through our property as part of that trail. It's a 100-kilometre walk around the Clare Valley. Pretty wow. Fun. Oh, Wow. <laughs> So it's great because a large portion of our property is natural bush. Yeah. So it's a little bit of get back to nature and lots of kangaroos. Yes. I to walk. Yeah. I like, like to take photos of when I can get them. <laughs> yes, do follow Batunga Cottages on Facebook and Instagram. They're a lovely photograph of very friendly looking kangaroos who 
do tend to well to welcome people yeah. into their space. I do, I do like it when they turn up for their gear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Try to arrange it, but can't guarantee it. <laughs> I don't like to show up. You've just got to get up early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm not going to hang around for you, but yeah. No. Oh, wonderful. And from what you learned as a kid to now, what's still supporting you as you go on, on this change of direction, but also staying connected to the arts as well? Um, I think some of the early lessons from my mother who used to drag me along to her yoga classes <laughs> with the WEA, yeah. she somehow convinced them to let her bring her child <laughs> to their house. Still don't know how she got away with it, but anyway, she did it. So I think that try making time. You have to make the commitment yeah. to find a little time for your own headspace. Mm. I feel very spoiled here because if I'm feeling overwhelmed, and provided I don't have guests arriving in the next hour, I can just go for a walk up the hill yeah. in the bush. Yeah. Oh, we have extraordinary bird life here, and take a breath. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're the important thing. Yeah. Well, I think people who live in our re- uh, regional and rural communities, you deserve that because it's such an important part of our life. It's such a wonderful resource for people in cities to be able to access. But you're hosting us in these spaces. You're helping to support the natural habitat and the regional economy. So if you get the bonus of being able to walk into up the hill and hear, listen to some birds, I think that's a fair trade <laughs> My husband's relatives, they own a, a farm and they work so hard on that farm. And it is a beautiful standing property. And I remember my sister-in-law was saying, oh, but it's well, I can just come and walk through the gully that we have here and feel protected and at peace any time I want. You know, it's doing really good things again for the local economy, for the local region, that you're partnering with Indigenous people to look at their practices for fire prevention, all sorts of things that you do. Yeah, if you get to enjoy some beautiful scenery around you, more power to you. And that you're so willing to share it with other people as well. Yeah, and and it's lovely to share it. And it's lovely to get feedback from people about how much they enjoy it. The people who, in the few years I've been here, we had three couples who now come every year because they just love, they know they've got the place to themselves. They can (laughs) yahoo quietly uh, and enjoy getting out of the city. It's yeah, good. yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for being with us today, Kerry. It's been a joy to talk to you. And I think we need to put the tongue on our bucket list because it's not that far from Sydney. We oh, had, far. Oh. Not that far. And my husband loves Adelaide. I don't think it'll be a hard sell. No. Uh, <laughs> we'll have details about the Tunga Cottages in the show notes. So if you do want to check it out and if you think that's something that will interest you, there you go. You can find out all about it. And otherwise we say thank you to Kerry and wish her well on her tree change. But also thank you for sharing your lessons through your various and really interesting career, but with a lot of hard work to make that happen. Thanks, Judith. Okay. Yeah, it was so, so lovely. Yeah, so, so much fun. Yeah, have good. a good laugh. Excellent. Nothing else we can do. We could all have a laugh. <laughs> All right, take care. I've loved listening to your stories and getting to know you even a bit more. And we'll be back next week with another episode of Aligned and Thriving, where you'll le- learn even more about how you support yourself in your working life and find those moments where you can connect to yourself. All the best. Bye. Thank you. So, Great to see you. Bye-bye. Bye. Don't miss a single episode, so subscribe to Aligned and Thriving now to unlock a world of inspiration and practical strategies. And if you have subscribed, why not check out our IG account or join our community to navigate your own way to a happier and healthier working life.